Hi, this is Carl James Lankford, uh, an Archaeology Cumbric Lecture that was recorded um, ending on the week, the 27th of October. Um, I'm delighted to bring the Archaeology of Artifacts. Um, this one today is looking at glass. I uh, would appreciate anyone watching these videos if they would subscribe. And if they do subscribe, um, I'm planning on doing some kind of a, a free gift um, for some of you um, guys who watch and comment on a regular basis. More about that later on in the video and also the more subscribers I have the more ability I've got to do live lectures via um, YouTube so I'm hoping to do that in a long distance future. Um, enjoy the video. Thank you. Some was recorded live in a lecture and part of it was abridged at the end because I didn't have enough recording. Thank you. itself across our wonderful land um, has been found in the archaeological record going all the way back to the Bronze Age and probably beyond. Um, when people started thinking about um, these wonderful um, objects known as beads or to create containers out of glass, we don't really know. It's the same thing that can be said um, when pottery was first invented by our ancestors. Uh, we don't really know that either because we've got, we've got clay figures um, going back about uh, 20, 25,000 to 30,000 years ago. Um, if they're making clay figures, there's no reason to say that they weren't making uh, pots to store things in. From our earliest origins, man has been making use of glass in a natural way as well. Um, some of the most accessible glass is glass that is otherwise known as obsidian. Now obsidian itself is volcanic glass. What we see um, in the archaeology going, you, you can look, okay, obsidian has been naturally there well before man. So, old woman, or maybe um, our first tools to scrape hides could have actually been seen as being obsidian when we start to see Homo habilis 1.8 million years ago or the first um, humanoids coming out of Africa a um, hundred thousand years ago and that obsidian itself we always feel must have been used for weapons but like many glass objects that we will see today glass itself has a whole variety of different uses. If I throw a bead at you, Pat, what would you say it was used for? What about using what about using a bead for money? Yeah, you were gonna say that, but your mouth was full of the fifth Welsh cake you've eaten today. said going back 6,000 years to 4,000 years BC, but it may not actually be much earlier than that. The problem is with glass and metal objects is that you can melt them down. You can't melt down pottery. When you created a pot, when you fired a pot, you cannot, when it's broken, right, you either discard it or you try and repair it. You cannot melt it down and make it into something else. If you've got a whole collection of beads, you can melt them down and make it into a bottle um, or a pane of window glass. Uh, metal is exactly the same. You can have a, a crate load of nails and you can make that into a beam for a building. Okay? Or you can use it for jewellery or anything. Let's look at this. And I'm going to finish this now because this is part of my next wonderful, enterprising example. Look at this. Right. Just think about it. So the use of glass, man-made glass, and the production of glass goes back, as I've said, 6,000 years ago. And the first items that we're seeing um, are beads, okay? And then we start to see glaciers glazes on metal objects and glaciers glazes on pottery. Basically a glaze on a pot is in fact glass, yeah? because it's, it's silica, you know, clay, glass, it all goes together. But look at, just
just think of this, okay? That there, you've got somebody who's melted and they, they've got um, a crucible and there's molten glass in it, okay? You want to produce a container. What you do, you get a ball of clay and you coat it with sand. And then you get the crucible and some tarts and tip it over that ball of clay and the sand. And because it's very viscous and it works very much like water, it will drip all the way down the, the, the length of that ball, all the way down to the earth. And then when you do, what you do, you let it dry, you let it cool, you let, you let it set, you let it go off, whatever word you want to use. When that's cool, you lift this up the right way, the contents in it are clay and sand, you basically take the dried out clay because the clay will have dried because of the heat it will simply drop out and you've got a container and we know that we know that's how they did it because some of the very earliest glass containers that we find what you do you see little in indents of the sand grains in the glass and that's how we know There would be a sand coating on it. No, 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 no. What I'm saying, you've got the crucible with, with the frit in it. Okay? Frit is the silica and the ash. Okay? Ground down. And then when that's, uh, when that's, when that's been processed, and obviously you've heated it up and all the rest of it, Poured into the crucible, more about, more about the process in a short while, and then you've got the ball there, and you s simply tip it over, and it will create a skirt. Just so you don't have to soak down the kettle with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Simple. And, uh, and, and that's, the, that, that's, that's the container. There you go, you drink out of it. That's it. Um, it's very simple technology, but it's very advanced. Somebody was able to make glass out of what, what is it? Sand? Exactly. Silica and sand. Um, is somebody that is very skilled and specialised and unique in society. Very much like the individuals that produced um, iron out of stone. They were very special in society. But I realised I made a bit of a mistake. Um, like all archaeologists have made exactly the same mistake. Except when you do these classes after a while, you repeat something over again and you see that there's a fault with it. The fault that I've been making is that I presume, like every other archaeologist, that somebody who's got the skill to produce iron out of a stone is a very unique person in society. I'm just talking about it from a modern sense. How many of us would be able to make glass in this room? How many of us would be able to make um, a sword out of a stone? How do I know that the same model existed in the past? What if there was a whole village and every single person in that village knew how to produce iron and was actively producing iron? I presume that it was a skill that only one person knew in that village. And I'm also presuming that that's the same with glass. But to be able to produce something like the glass is something very special. And the person who introduced it to the village or the community, whether they shared it or not, let's say that they did share it and everyone learned that skill, it would have been a very special thing indeed. I, I presume that everybody in the past was an idiot like us lot, okay? Speak for myself. Um, I put in our uh, interpretation today on the past, which is the wrong thing to do. I don't know how this computer works. I have no idea how I can communicate with somebody in Australia just like that, okay? My idea is there's some kind of tele telepathy in, in, in place, right? That's the only way I'm being able to work it out. I have no idea how this works. But the same thing can be said, um, how long do I need to heat um, the raw materials to make glass? Apparently days, not just hours, days. You need to be able to sit there, you need to be able to look at the temperature. And glass as well, to be able to create the colours 
in the glass containers that you're using, you've got to be able to watch the temperature. And when you throw a bit of oxide into it, cobalt blue, it goes a certain tinge of blue, okay? But if you throw copper into something, the usual thing is it should come out green. But if you use the temperature rightly, it can turn out blue. It's all to do with temperature and knowledge. And it's likely that it's more accessible knowledge in the past than all archaeologists have been saying. Because there comes to a point in the Iron Age that there's lots of beads being found on archaeological sites up and down our fair land. Oh, I've gone right off the uh, subject. Um, glass blowing became very common just before the period um, of the birth of Christ. Just before. Glass blowing in our land. Um, it was people were standing to blow glass. So you're talking about proper glass containers. It's a very difficult concept to get our, our minds around. Okay? People are living in roundhouses and they're able to blow glass containers.
they, they were very specialised items, um, simply because they weren't able to take the impurities out. Maybe our ancestors wanted it like that. It's obvious as if we paint this gloss on the past, our ancestors were stupid and they, they accidentally left the impurities in. You know, all the bits of sort of um, um, charcoal and unspent stone and all the rest of it. Maybe they wanted it in there. Um, it was not until the period of the Romans coming over that the Romans really introduced glass blowing um, on um, an industrial scale. And they introduced something else. And the mould, okay, the two-piece mould. Uh, oh, like this, like this. Um, you, you've got you've got a blow hole in there, okay, um, and you've got your um, your ceramic tip. Um, you've got your um, piece of wood reed or something coming out as you as you blow in, okay. And then what you have there, um, you've got the molten glass, like that. I'll close that quickly. Keep blowing into it, and the molten glass will fill the space. And then it dries out. Go to the Easy. Two-piece mold. Done. The Romans introduced that. It may sound it may sound simple to me. It's not simple to me at all. But these people did it week in, week out. Um, we, we 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 think today um, that because we ourselves can't do this. That our ancestors found it very difficult and it was such a laborious process. No, it wasn't. They did it day in, day out. You know? Um, it's like me doing this every week. Um, it becomes second nature. Um, it's like me doing a ghost walk. I have people coming up to me saying, How do you remember all the stories? Because I've done it week in, week out. I know what I'm talking about. But you come along to one of my ghost walks, I'm doing it for the first time and I don't know what I, I, I haven't done it before. You know, I, I've, I've, I've got to go at the front of the group. Say, look at a card, put it in my pocket, and do it again. You can fit. Um, <laughs> actually, it's very difficult to make up ghost stories. So, it. Shut up! Um, the secret of. Are you trying to say I'm making it all up? Now, the secret of glass making, this, this blowing into a mold uh, introduced by the Romans, um, is something that um, sort of died out for a little bit when Roman civilization had collapsed in Britain in the year 476 there was a period where this sort of glass blower had sort of completely disappeared uh, but then the Anglo-Saxons started introducing glass on a mall or navy okay they start introducing something that's very specialized very unique uh, but very delicate you start to think if they were warring all the time in the period of the Anglo-Saxons after the Romans, how did they have time to uh, produce this glass? By looking at the little intricacies of glass, you start to realise that things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, but then after that, you've got the Venetians, and you've got glass being introduced from Europe and so on. But just before all that, we know that there's a thriving glass industry um, in Jaro and Weirmouth, up in the north, in AD um, 680. Glass itself is being manufactured in York. Um, people like glass. But but when archaeologists excavate, they, they excavate a glass container that's unique. They go, oh, I've used the wrong word. Unique is the next word. Archaeologists, they go, oh, wow, look at that glass container. It's unique. There must be only, they must have, the rubbers only must have produced one of these containers. Right, oh, it's so unique. Let's put it in the museum and all the rest of it. Um, they fail to they failed to mention to you that the Anglo-Saxons would have gone around Roman burial grounds, knowing exactly what was in the ground. Um, cremated Romans put their bodies um, in glass jars. All you need to do is take that glass jar out of the ground, heat it up, and then you can uh, you make a new container. The problem is, in archaeology, we've only got 1% of the picture in some cases. And um, it's, it's like the Guanche mummies from the Canary Islands. At one point, there were tens of thousands of them, and now there's only five in the world, because they were all ground down. Um, the whole movies were ground down um, for a cure for stomach. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, these glass objects weren't back then unique. They were very populous. There were many of them, like we see loads of glass beads in the Bronze and the Iron Age. Right, well, we need to see some images, don't we? Uh, but, yes we do, 
But it's like it's like those hats on the table. I, I, I was I was saying this the other day, Mary. I was saying that um, you know I I I've been I've been knitting a scarf for Michelle for a year, right? Still not there. There's 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 hours and hours of work in it, right? Um, you know, I'm there on a minibus, right, knitting away, right, I've done, I've done ten lines and I leave it for a few months and I come back to it. But the fact of the matter is the time that I'm spending in that scaff might turn out to be about, um, I don't know, 50 hours of, of knitting, right? So that should be 50 times 10, that scarf should cost somebody 500 quid. It should do, it really should. And, and the reason why I was saying this was that um, iron objects and iron talk in the Iron Age, okay, that took days to produce because they had to mine the iron, they had to break it up, they had to heat it up over and over again, they had to get the plume, they had to hammer it out. It took them days to produce that one iron torque. That iron torque itself to the Iron Age people would have been very valuable. Gold itself in some parts of Britain you could just pick it out of a river. West Wales, it would have been plentiful in rivers. Parts of Scotland, plentiful in rivers. You could have picked gold out by the handful. You could have made a talk in minutes. Okay? That talk would have been less valuable than the iron talk. But now, gold is not very um, easy to obtain. Iron is very easy to obtain because there's loads of it about. It's, it's, it's the concept of the past. <laughs> And, and, and people's value, um, and all that's changed now, and that idea of patience is very important. So, let's, let's, uh, let's get on to my do dare effort. Let's get on to my images, because I've only got one plug thing here, I'm going to keep on uh, moving around a little bit. But if, if a do dare thing of a jig Birkins comes up on the effort on you, you can let me know, okay? Images. What's that? You got the key. Oh right, I've, I've gone a bit too far now. There's nothing wrong with going a bit too far, is there, Bill? Yeah, there you go. Bronze Age beat. But there's one problem. Lots of these Bronze Age beats are actually being found on Iron Age sites. You can't. Because they're basically, um, it's not going to be a very difficult thing to create. If, if, if you've got the viscous qualities of the glass and you've got some kind of a mould, all you need to do is just actually, the, the, the wonderful thing with glass is it, it immediately fills the space and it immediately creates, like iron, when you drop it on the surface, it actually um, 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 creates an orb. Like, and then all you need to do is stick a, a, a twig in it as it's drying. That burns away and you've got a hole in it. But you, you, are, all, you are all easily forgiven if you, if you uh, presume that that's a bead. You're all easily forgiven if you tell me that that there um, looks like it was jewellery. Just uh, because we don't have all the time on the earth today, that's, um, that's one form of bead. Blue beads, lots of blue beads in the Iron Age. These are Bronze Age examples, um, and that there is another form of glass. Can you remember those alleys that you used to have when you were children? They, they weren't clear, they, they were solid, solid glass, yeah? Like this. Um, now, an archaeologist finding this in the ground immediately would say that this bead uh, is a, a piece of jewellery. Um, but, but the archaeologist would also say the same if they found a 
children's play encounter, which was the size of a marble with a hole through it. The archaeologists would immediately say, that's got to be jewellery. But in fact, the original aim of that, um, that piece that they're finding with a hole drilled through it was a counter for a child's game. And there's a reason why there's a hole drilled through it, because if the child swallows that, they're not going to choke to death. So it's always that presumption that we know what's going on, but we don't. Just because there's a hole through it, you find coins in China. That is seen to be money, okay? Chinese money with a, with a, with a hole through it. Okay, you can have a little bit of a string here. You can have ten of these on the string. Well, you go to market, you give one of the coins, put the string back on, job done. It's your purse, it's your wallet. Are we saying that this could have been money or currency? Some archaeologists are. Um, now, this is, this is an absolutely fascinating piece of work. I did this today um, in Lanswick Major, um, and we explained this map. Um, we'll explain this map in detail in a, in a few moments. But one thing about this map, what you can see is just distributions of beads in the Iron Age. Um, glass beads in the Iron Age. And it's interesting that it, on this map, there are areas where these glass beads can be found. But there's one very important thing about this. Most 85 to 90% of all the glass beads found in the Iron Age in this part of Scotland are yellow in colour, whereas 80 to 85% of all glass beads found in East Yorkshire are blue in colour. Don't you think that's a bit strange? Peter, who has worked at Down Corning in my class on Tuesday, said the reason why that is um, the, the material they've got available uh, defines the colour of the beads that they produce. And my answer was just simple. You're not talking about producing um, a, a boat out of glass, okay? You could have an itinerant craftsman moving from village to village with a, a pannier on his donkey. On each of these panniers on the donkey, there might be enough raw material to produce thousands and thousands of beads, right? You don't need to be in an area to produce these beads, okay? You take your trade with you, you can do that, yeah? But it might be that the skill of the blowing of the beads gave its colour. They may have, they obviously Rangers and Celtic, um, you may have had that idea that one regional area thought itself recognised by one bead and the other one of another bead. It might not be that at all. Because um, how is it you account for the whole area of Cumbria and there's no beads? So they did, are you saying that they didn't have a football club? You said that it, beads? Yeah, you say that they, they weren't part of this equation? There is one huge problem with all of this and this map. There are um, settlements up and down this Scottish coast known as Brocks. We come across many thousands of settlements but very few beads. Many thousands of settlements down here and loads of beads. Same up in Yorkshire, same up in Scotland. Um, we've got the problem in archaeology of archaeologists for many years just discarding glassware. And the reason why is that when you're excavating, you've got a metal tool. And you're travelling away, and you can easily break glass. Glass itself in a bead form, very small beads, if you're working in winter months and you want to get through the excavation quick, you might simply clay bucket. A dirty bead is very difficult to identify. These artefacts have become lost. And it's only over recent years that people have actually come to recognise how important these beads are. These types of beads, more Iron Age beads, we'll come on to this in a bit more detail. Reconstructed beads from the Garrow Tour. And these are actually examples of Roman glass. Go through these quickly. Uh, more Roman glass. We know that that Roman glass was actually completely transparent once. And we know because what archaeologists have done, they've, they've got bits of broken Roman glass that are patinaed, faded. They heat it back up again. And do you know what happens? It goes back to its original fiery colour. Lots of Roman glass would have been transparent or translucent. This is a Roman jug. Look at the delicate work there, all found intact in the archaeology. If you go through the ground with a pickaxe and you did this, 
this, that's uh, game over. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of glass. And, and I found glass on a number of times in archaeology myself. And uh, one unfortunate occasion was when I was the uh, uh, very, very well paid archaeologist at the excavation at Boverton. And, uh, and I basically went off for lunch once. And we, we had all these wonderful blue glass bottles left on the chair on the site. Um, and, um, and I just went off on break. The beautiful blue glass bottles from the 1840s. They're really lovely things. Um, and I went off site, somebody accidentally knocked the chair, and they all smashed the pieces on the floor. Right? And the first thing that we did was to brush them up and get rid of them. Because there is, there, there is the health and safety would, would um, preclude me from ruining it all together. And because it was in fragments, it would have, it would have taken days to try and put. So that's it. And that's the problem with glass. Because it, it's so fragile, but um, years before that, I was field walking at a place called Lantruth in place, um, and there was a plant field there, and we were going across the field, and suddenly somebody um, came across a piece of very fine glass, and first of all, we thought they'd get some light bulbs, and we were collecting them all together. They weren't, they were actually very delicate um, white glasses, or claret glasses, uh, with dated That there is placed in here as a, a red herring. That's Roman glass found in a tomb in China, but more about that in a short while. That there is what happens when you um, find glass in the ground, Roman glass in the ground, and you heat it back up, you anneal it, uh, you make it into the old third, which I mentioned, the frit, I should say. Uh, you break it all up, uh, then you anneal it, get it into shape, you blow it, and the Roman glass comes out into its original colour. Um, I, 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 was, I had a relationship many years ago with a very um, demanding woman, and uh, every week I'd see her, I, I would, I would buy her something. And one, one day I bought, I went into this shop and I thought, oh, she, I like that. There were these earrings, and in the end was a little bit of Roman glass. These earrings cost me about 40, 50 quid. A little bit of Roman glass. I gave it to her, and she said, I won't wear these until you get me the chain. Okay, uh, I never saw her wearing it, um, but the fact of the matter is the point is, the very point there is that I was told by the woman in the shop, they've got this site in Israel, and they've got massive loads of this uh, fur, and massive loads of this recycled glass, and, and they're just selling it. Uh, but if you melted that down, you'd, you'd get um, examples of this um, that are shown in front of you. Um, and the point is, is that um, glass itself is a material that can be recycled quite easily. And that's why we don't get as many items left from the Roman period. Okay, Bill, you're, all, you're, if you're not Anglo-Saxon, you've, no, you've got no trade links, but you know from experience in that ploughed field over there that somebody ploughed up some glass. Go back there. Oh, wicked, that's a really nice uh, glass container. Don't look that good. You smash it all up. That's why we don't find many surviving. That there is a scenery urn. Now that's an example from Italy, but we've found many examples of these in this country. A bit more about this later. Uh, that's uh, that's cobalt blue glass. Um, that there has got another story, which we'll come on to. Uh, beautiful example of a, a gladiator cup there. Um, and that's um, Anglo-Saxon glass, more Anglo-Saxon glass, and we're going to end it on stained glass. Right, let's go, um, let's go to this. Now, this article, if we don't do anything today, we're doing this. Uh, this is a wonderful piece. Uh, decoration and colour of Iron Age glass beads from Britain. Uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase some of this. Although a history of glass in Britain begins in the Bronze Age, it is in the Iron Age, uh, about 750 BC to about AD 43, that we find evidence for objects made of this material in increasing quantities, made definitely in our own country. 
Um, the types, the composition analysis are being looked at gradually by archaeologists. The biggest problem with a bead is this. To analyse it, to analyse it what it's made from and probably get a great a dent, you've got to put the thing in a crucible and you've got to smash it up. You get all the dent evidence you like, but no beads left. Um, that's the biggest problem that we've got with some types of archaeology. Very difficult to date unless we destroy it. Dend dendrochronology, dend dendrochronology, or dr drill into a tree, okay, to, to get um, a sample out. Now, what we're going to do, a bit of technological um, advance here. We're going to have two images on the screen at once. Don't say how wonderful you are. You could have said it, Dorothy. I'm really felt happy. Right, um, the reason why I'm fascinated by this, and I don't know if you can really see it there, but you can see basically make up four regions. You've got um, just below Cape Ness, Inverness in Scotland, uh, you've got East Yorkshire, York, uh, you've got East Anglia, uh, Norfolk, Suffolk, and you've got South West Wiltshire. So you've got those four, four, four areas. You can't see it properly, don't worry about it, you've got the idea. Um, these red ones indicate that in those spots you've got about, about 200 in there for a reason. And, uh, and they, they've done a study of this and it's about time too. In my own book on the Romans in America Morgan, this is about the Iron Age, but, but there's, there's mentions in the book about blue glass beads, um, which have some uh, symbolism to me. Um, four study regions were selected and it indicates the following. What we find in North East Scotland, uh, beads that have been reported and recorded by archaeologists uh, from the Iron Age, 360 beads found in that, in that area there. Yeah? East Yorkshire, 882 beads found. East Anglia, 26. And the southwest of England, Wiltshire, and so on, um, 517 beads. Why is this significant? The answer is going to come out now. Analysis suggests that there were two major trends in glass colour and that uh, these are strongly regional. And what that is as follows. Um, what we find in the southwest of England, we, we see about 25% of beads that we find in that area um, are actually blue in colour. And then we get about just over 40% in yellow and there's some other colours as well. Um, and colourless colours. Um, and then, interestingly enough, in East Anglia, we have something similar but the reverse. In, in East Anglia, Norfolk and Suffolk, what we find is that we've got um, about 45% blue beads and about 20% yellow. But to me, what is absolutely fascinating is this. In East Yorkshire, in places like York, and towards the coast, nearly 80% of all beads found are blue and hardly any yellow. That's interesting. But what is even more interesting is just around 80, um, just over 80% of all beads found in the, from the Iron Age in North East Scotland are actually yellow and very, very few.
much as everything else. Now, it's said that the decoration um, on these beads can be dots, lines, zigzags, a combination of white and blue, a combination of, um, um, say, if you've got a combination of blue and yellow, you can also get green, uh, which is obvious as anything. But the, the idea that they're using these beads um, to determine yeah. something, or some, in some areas you've just got spirals, in other areas you've just got lines. And it says here that they're distinctive from region to region. So it's not just about the raw materials bill, it's about lots of things. Clear regional patterns, suggesting that they may have held important information when used or put on display in the Iron Age. And putting on display um, might not mean putting on display um, on the surface of your garments. It might be putting on display underneath your garments, as we saw with jewellery. Um, right. Some explanations of why um, these were, were being used and where they'd been found. And this next thing throws everything out the window that I've said about archaeology and where you find things. For the past few, few weeks we've been saying that jewellery is usually found with bodies. Swords are usually found with bodies. Um, hordes are usually not found with bodies and those types of things. But listen with this. There are only a few instances where glass beads have been found within incubation burials, within burials, very few examples. And that's very important. If you're thinking about beads being used for status, why is it they're found in very, very few um, incubation burials? They're in fact absent in burials that we would actually think were of some view, some views of great importance. Um, it's they're very they're very exceptional items in that we don't really understand them. Were they used for necklaces or charms? Equally, they could have been used, sewn into clothing. That that new fad, we, we've got sequins. Well, not the sequins, you push them down, you get one design, push them up. Sequins have been around for, uh, uh, for many years. But then you see people actually sewing buttons. Buttons. We're not buttons of where they're supposed to go. And then you see beads being sewn on. Um, and that's something that happened in the past, maybe. They may have adorned horses, they may have been um, in the uh, horse parade, for example. Uh, they could have been spindle walls. Um, very, very strange. There are, oh, there are only 34 instances where glass beads were found in inhumations. None found in burials in that region of Scotland, and none found in burials in that area of Norfolk and Suffolk. And here we go. Nine found in burials in, in, uh, in uh, southwest England, and 25 found in burials in East uh, Yorkshire. Conclusion Just as there are strong regional uh, settlement and burial patterns for Iron Age Britain, there are also regional patterns in the glass beads and other dress objects. This may indicate that dress was used to mark out different regional identities. However, there is a danger in assuming that glass beads were intrinsically for high status. For example, while they may seem rare compared to other types of material culture, brooches and coins, the number of known glass beads is the product of not only different regional and chronological patterns in the past, but also different recovery techniques and methods in the present. Basically, some archaeologists have found these beads and just chucked them away. So everything else is of importance, but other things are chucked away. I was on an archaeological site in Spain this one time, um, and it was a place known as uh, uh, Santa Maria, it was near, near Madrid. And uh, I, was, I was excavating these beautiful Roman tiles, and I was excavating them like this, right? Um, and I was travelling away, and I found an alignment of these trowels, these, these tiles. I was actually a student on this excavation, and I was paid to be there by uh, the European community, believe it or not. Um, and as I was going like this, there was somebody travelling towards me, ripping all the tiles up. She had been told by a university that these tiles were not important and just to discard them. At that moment, I did my night to Manigold and the uh, excavation leader, um, who gave the excuse, well, she's not really well trained, but she didn't understand. Well, she was a student. They would be in pain.
paid to have her on site. So they couldn't throw her off site. Date. 
but other archaeologists would say not interested in that. Let's get rid of it. Um, composition analysis. Um, what? Where's the social context? How are they found? We need all that information. Um, it's all about networks, and it, and that chart, chart which we just seen, because this is about it, um, it. These bees may have played some form of importance in Iron Age society. Are they to do with networking? Are they to do with relationships? Um, why are they there? Okay, they're not buried with bodies, for example. Um, and this this last point is is very interesting. Colour, as we've seen, is important. Colour, yellow, um, in that part of Scotland, in the north east. Um, Colour in um, South uh, Yorkshire is is blue. Um, and it, it's said that, now this is an interesting statement, given that the period before the birth of Christ is often seen as a turning point in terms of settlements and material culture, beads come into their own. It's likely that bead production increased, there was more raw materials, but strangely enough, around the birth of Christ, between the invasion of the Romans about AD 43, bead production completely diminished. And if these beads were used for currency, at that time we had introduced our own coinage. But we may not have been using our coinage for trade. Right. Most coins produced back then were just used to show off. Look at my leader. Right. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Uh, any questions? No? Break. Um, Bristol Blue Glass uh, comes much later, but that's obviously the cobalt blue in it. That, that, that's a very famous glass there. We used to come across it on our excavation at St. Brian's. Right, let's have a break. Thanks for listening so far. Um, some of the recording wasn't great. My, um, my usual recording device, the um, Zoom, seems to run out of uh, power very quickly. Um, so um, I'm usually not able to use that. I'm having to uh, record off my phone. But hopefully next week will be different. Um, I'd like to um, request that anyone listening to my videos to subscribe to my channel. Um, as I said at the beginning. So press the subscribe button as you see it. I'll be very grateful and uh, it's all about networking here and getting everybody's support. Right, now we're going to go over to part two. Uh, the problem is with my part two is uh, simply um, I didn't manage to uh, keep um, the second part of the re recording for part two. So this is the archaeology of artifacts glass part two. Now We've uh, extensively looked at uh, beads um, from the Iron Age and we've got some images in front of us and very much fascinated by the idea of beads but let's now move on to Roman glass. Now the image in front of you shows a whole variety of Roman glass from the Holy Land, the Levant, uh, mainly made in places like Syria, imported items. This item that you can see in front of you uh, would be very much transparent um back in the day but obviously the patina has altered the effect on this pot we've looked at this chunk and finding something like this in the archaeology um, in a british context would be a marvel and it was found in a british context the item as follows now is not uh, from a british context uh, this is actually from China, but um, we've mentioned over the past few weeks Japan and Chinese links with uh, Great Britain. Um, and this is a Roman link with uh, the far distant world of uh, China, dated from about uh, the 200s, um, associated with a tomb from that period in China. So imports and exports, exports were going abound. Now, I've got a very interesting piece that I'm going to read out. This is the evidence for the production of glass in Roman Britain by Jennifer Price, Leeds University. I'll, I'll just sort of take extracts that I need, really. Um, the idea of glass and the glass industry has long been indicated in Britain. And we're starting to find furnace sites and evidence of glass 
uh, making. Um, but most of our evidence of glass making in Britain comes from the debris um, and not the furnaces found, but the rubbish deposits which glass would accumulate and obviously building up with the moulds uh, needed for glass blowing and so on. Now glass production um, isn't seen in the ancient literature in a British context, um, but what we do find is, as we said, um, archaeological inferences. Um, we, we, we find um, square or rectangular bottles with the stamp on the bot base uh, referring to CCV, which might refer to the Colonia Claudia Victris, which is, in other words, the site of modern Colchester. That's one interpretation anyway. The types of archaeological evidence likely to be available uh, for glass furnace houses um, come in five categories. The raw material and glass frit, uh, which is the material before it's smelted down. Uh, evidence of furnaces, then evidence of annealing ovens, crucibles um, with glass in them. So we know that they, they were used for smelting glass and glass waste. Uh, the, the product um, byproducts and so on of the glass making industry. Much of the evidence from Britain um, consists of isolated finds, but put that all together, we've got uh, many archaeologists believe a thriving glass industry. The basic raw materials for the manufacture of, of Roman glass being sand, sodium, um, silica, lime, deposits of these on a site should only be interpreted as the raw materials for glass production if they are found in an undoubted relationship with some of the other evidence that we've mentioned. This type of evidence um, can be associated with production in places like um, Ratea uh, Ratea, which is uh, Leicestershire, Viraconium, Roxeter, Viraconium Roxeter, a small excavation at the side of a road to the southwest of the town revealed an area of uh, hards and the type of glass waste associated with vessel blowing. This waste appears to be in situ at the edge of a glass working site. White sand was also found, though subsequent chemical analysis has uh, indicated that this was extremely unlikely to have been raw material for the glass, but may have been associated with the processing to create the glass in the first place. When we look at glass itself, um, you could uh, think of um, uh, the, the, the frit, the sand and the alkali, the alkali being basically ash, um, ash wood or beech wood or something similar. This involved heating them together at a low temperature for a long period, maybe days, uh, before the resulting frit was ground up and melted to form glass. Basically the frit is, um, could be referred to as um, scrap glass or frit from the raw materials. A lump of frit is more likely to be recognised as evidence for glass production within the Roman period. Um, possible evidence um, for this comes from the Coppergate excavation, and they're known for its Viking activity in York, but also Roman evidence being found there as well. Various other sites where lumps of glass um, material has been found, and recycling of glass um, in Britain, particularly sites like Colchester. Um, when I do record these lectures, you come across uh, questions um, and said answers being given. Um, we've looked at some of these images already, so um, looking through these, the next one that we come across um, is this vessel, a square vessel. Some of these were used for Cinerians. This is an example from Chester, um, and this Cinerian from Chester itself uh, there's other counterparts in Britain, very limited. Uh, one very large counterpart to be found in the museum in Killian um, was used as a cinnery um, urn. I've got an example of a cinnery urn and one example I always tell in my lectures in 1942-1943 where they were filling sandbags at the Atlanta train estate um, in Barrie where the American um, Airborne Division was based. Um, in preparation for the D-Day landings in 1944. Um, two servicemen, one remarked hitting some glass, it sma smashed whilst they were filling sandbags, that was ignored, but another glass uh, vessel was recovered, exactly the one shown in this image. Um, very interesting with all that being said, that uh, this glass vessel was then uh, emptied of its contents, 
the service man, American service man then filled it up with um, some local ale, sent it over to America, not washing out any of the dust within. Um, and this going over to America, we lost a piece of archaeology, but the description is clear that the, the, this site where they were filling the sand uh, being a site uh, that was very much uh, a cemetery. And in the 1980s, they excavated the site again, and they found over 40 human remains, many of them dating from this period of the late Roman period, going up um, to 476 and beyond into the medieval period and later, uh, with some of these cinnary jars being part of that assemblage. Uh, we mentioned that uh, lots of glass being found in very British contexts uh, can be very ornate like this one. Uh, moving on from um, Roman glass, let's just have um, a little look at um, examples of glass uh, which have been found in an Anglo-Saxon context. It's said, for example, that most glass uh, found in Anglo-Saxon context uh, was being produced after, say, the 600s, when Anglo-Saxon Britain became a little bit more settled. This image itself showing uh, now the, the blue uh, bowl known as the Cunderston Bowl. Uh, this early um, vessel from the 600s, um, probably uh, made in Kent, not much larger than a large mug, was discovered in 1847 in Cunderston, Oxfordshire. It was found in the grave um, of an individual. Uh, it's very difficult to see, say if this individual was of high rank or whether this individual was of lowly rank. Uh, but the, the vessel went, disappeared completely, not to be rediscovered until 1971 in a house in Leicestershire, uh, being used as a flower vase. Remains of Anglo-Saxon glass making furnaces to create glass that we're showing in front of us now. Um, have been found in several areas, notably at York, Glastonbury and Kent. Anglo-Saxon glass making was directly influenced by Roman practices, but the results were generally less refined. But I wouldn't say this is less refined, would you? Uh, these examples that we're seeing um, in front of us, the Cunderston Bowl um, and so on. A great deal of Anglo-Saxon glass was made by melting down broken uh, uh, broken glass or just glass uh, cinnery urns uh, and then remelting it down and reworking it. Making glass from raw materials would not have been outside the idea of the Anglo-Saxons but there was so much Roman glass around so why not recycle it. Uh, the raw materi materials are silicate uh, as we saw in the Roman example generally sand and an alkali generally ash uh, were mixed and heated together in an oven for several days. It was then broken up put into a crucible and melted in a furnace to produce glass, which was then blown into a variety of shapes. When made in this form, the glass was clear or slightly tinged. To make um, coloured glass, it was necessary to add a variety of minerals or materials, or, or basically to uh, just generally um, sort of change your, your heating necessities. Back to the Cunniston Bowl as we close. Uh, looking um, at some of these examples uh, of our wonderful uh, Anglo-Saxon glass. Um, uh, the bowl's dark blue colour was uh, created by adding copper to the molten glass. Copper, and not cobalt blue. Copper could produce green as well, depending on what temperatures you use in the furnace. Around the upper part of the bowl um, is a thin applied trail of glass arranged in 10 tight spirals. The lower part of the bowl is decorated with 30, 13 vertical loops. These trails were formed by applying molten glass to the outer surface. This squat dark blue jar or bowl was probably a drinking cup and was contained within the grave with other items including another a blue bowl which has probably since become lost. All associated maybe uh, with uh, being grave goods uh, associated with a Christian. Uh, we're always told that a Christian did not have grave goods, but I always say in my lectures that's absolute rubbish. If you wanted grave goods, Jesus Christ didn't say you couldn't have grave goods uh, when you were buried. Uh, so if you find a body without grave goods, it doesn't mean to say it's a Christian. It could be a pagan equally the other way, way around. We're getting to the end of this lecture today. Um, one of the most fascinating uh, areas of um, 
glass is when it's used in a medieval context after 1066. The example in front of you is from, from Toyers um, in France. But this example now, uh, where you, in France you've got um, complete windows that haven't been destroyed in Britain. This example in front of us from St. Mary's Church, medieval stained glass from Burnham Deepdale. This example in front of us is a reconstructed um, glass pane. Um, and this wonderful reconstructed glass pane is a reconstructed glass pane out of glass that was smashed up to obtain the lead in periods of Christian church persecution um, in the 1530s, 1540s, when monasteries and churches were being hacked out of their I I iconography. And then again in the 1650s, a persecution of churches. Uh, St. Mary's Church has an Anglo-Saxon round tower with a lead cap, both nave and chancel of early English from the 1200s. So the, most, the, most of the glass dates from then, but is extensively restored in the 1700s, 1800s. However, there are a number of medieval glass survivals um, uh, with rediscoveries of glass from the 1700s and 1800s, which have been refitted, such as fragments of medieval glass in the porch windows, reset in windows below the tower, and also in the west window of the north aisle. Great treasures in the church, very rare in Britain, but we've got other examples of glass stained, um, stained glass in York, Canterbury, and one or two other localities in Great Britain. Glass continues to be made today and obviously mass manufactured. There, there was examples to be able to, go, to create small glass panes even in the Roman period. But stained glass is to give you varieties of colours of glass to be adorned in churches. This is my lecture for glass. Obviously, hopefully you do some of your own research. This is Carl James Dyford. Uh, next week's le lecture will be looking um, at the fascinating uh, subject of the archaeology of artefacts looking at shoes. This is Carl James Edford. Thanks for listening today. And watch more and please share and please um, subscribe to my channel.